Praise the Lord, everybody. This is Elder Audrey Dowling with Prayer Walls, Prophetic Intercession, and Warfare Ministry, a ministry that is designed to pray for and intercede for our Christian pastors. I'm of the belief that pastors need someone or someone's praying specifics for them on a regular basis. And today, I wanted to start a series of training for those who would like to know more about how to pray for their pastor or how to pray effectively for their pastors. And I'm going to start today with part one and maybe around part two or three, I will get into how to pray for the pastor. I want to start today with praying for the pastor with some basics on the importance of praying for the pastor. Let's open up with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you right now for this day that you've made for us. We want to thank you right now for everything in it and of it. Thank you, Lord, for the ways that you have made and the doors that you've opened. We ask you right now, Lord, to bless all that we would hear today. Bless us right now, Lord, and we give your name the glory for it, the praise for it, honor in Jesus' name. Amen. And everybody says amen. And so today, again, I'm going to start um, with part one. Um, in a series of trainings that's going to um, help those who would like to pray more effectively for their pastors. Um, basically, I just want to start with a little bit of background about me and my prayer life. Um, I want to let you know I was around 11 or 12 years old, um, and I used to attend um, a prayer meeting uh, in our neighborhood. Um, I would stop playing go check the clock so that I wouldn't be late and I would go and attend these prayer services and primarily all of the time I was the only child, only kid there. But for some reason, I just knew that I had to be there. And um, I've always had a fascination with prayer. Um, I used to sit by the door. Um, my late grandmother, um, Eva May Glover, used to pray um, she prayed out loud. And so when we would visit her home, I would sit by the door so that I could hear her pray. I wasn't necessarily trying to spy on what she was saying. I just, um, I just wanted, I just thought it was fascinating. I, you know, that somebody was talking to God and praying to God. And so, um, my dad had a mantra and that was that prayer changes things. He said that so often that it just became a part of something that I'd always known. Um, uh, it had become my mantra, you know, one of my mantras at least. Um, prayer changes things. And um, as I grew, um, I began to teach on the subject of prayer. Um, I started prayer ministries in churches. I was always a part of the prayer ministry in any church that I attended. Um, I basically um, wrote um, booklets that people are still using about the basics of prayer and um, how to pray and um, just some very basic things about prayer on, on intercession and on prophetic intercession. Um, and now today, I wanted to talk to you about the very important topic of praying for our pastors. I think... Um, we need to build a culture of prayer and intercession within our Christian churches where the prayer for the pastor is an automatic thing. Now, I know that there are some ministries who have very um, flourishing and very strategic prayer ministry for their pastors, and I thank God for those. But mainly, uh, the average church does not have a ministry set up that's praying um, on a regular basis for their pastor. You may have, you may do an inventory and get um, others to say, yeah, I'm praying for my pastor. But when you do that, you'll find out that it's merely mentioning the pastor in prayer. Well, if you want to get beyond mentioning the pastor in prayer or saying something like bless the pastor, then I pray that you would tune in and watch these videos that's on this very important subject of how to pray effectively for your pastor. And um, 
So with that, I'm going to start with um, part one, praying for your pastor. Now, I want to let you know I have some materials here, and I will be looking down every now and then. I hope that is not a distraction to you. I hope that you are able to hear what I'm trying to say um, today. Often, the least prayed for individual in the church is the pastor. He is expected to pray for, encourage, advise, counsel, impart, help get delivered, many, many other things that he's um, expected to do um, for the members in his congregation. But very, very few times does he receive some of those same things. The pastor may never ask for prayer. And in the slight chance that she does, it is often not taken seriously. I believe that the pastor has the most important job in this present life. He helps people to connect to their spiritual side and ultimately map out their eternal path. This is why I believe that members of the church should consider it critically important to pray for their pastor. It is a thing of reciprocity. Reciprocity is the practice of exchanging things with others for mutual benefit. Members would pray for their pastor in order that he would be able to release the gifting that he has in his fullest capacity. We learn more about the importance of praying for our pastors through some very important questions that we must really think about. And one of those questions is, who are pastors to God? If you really want to get down to, you know, the importance of praying for your pastor, you got to think about who are pastors to God. Number one, pastors are chosen from the very heart of God. In Jeremiah, the third chapter in the 15th verse, God promised to give the children of Israel pastors according to his heart that would feed them with knowledge and understanding. From the story of Abraham to the story of your pastor, you will always find God choosing and using leaders in the lives of his people. Feeding a person with knowledge and understanding depicts a process of growth from the planting of a seed, knowledge, to the point of matured action or growth, understanding. So knowledge is knowing about something. Wisdom is knowing what to do with what you know. Understanding is when you follow through with the expected action to show that you truly get it. And we find that in Proverbs, the fourth chapter and the seventh verse. It says, wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. But in all of thy getting, it says, to get understanding. So what God does is he chooses pastors, the Bible says, out of his own heart. He searches out a person that he knows would not be a hireling. He searches out a person that will stay with the sheep, that will guide the sheep, that will lead the sheep and care for the sheep. So he chooses out this person that's going to feed them with knowledge and understanding. And that person, that feeding them with knowledge and understanding are not two things, knowledge, understanding. No, it depicts a process over time. So it depicts knowledge where, you know, basically you take someone from being a babe in Christ, where you're planting a seed, where you're teaching them about who the Lord is, on to the point of matured growth and understanding. And that may take a number of years in somebody's life. That may take some time to grow them to into the individual that the Lord wishes and desires for them to be. So when he says knowledge and understanding, understand that that means a process. Somebody that's going to take the time out 
that is necessary to work out the kinks of a person's life, to bring them to the point of understanding or matured growth and discipleship. So then the next thing, pastors, who are pastors to God is what we're trying to answer. Pastors are friends to God. In James, the second chapter in the 23rd verse, the word says that Abraham believed God and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. Abraham's belief and trust in God, it earned him the right to be called a friend of God. Now, a friend is someone you can talk to about anything. Someone you can tell your secrets to. Now, there is something that you share with a friend you may never share with someone else. A friend gets to know you in a way that many others may not. Remember when God was letting Aaron and Miriam know about his special relationship with Moses? Aaron and Miriam, they thought they were all on the same level. They thought they could get things, uh, or they were in, a place, in such a place with God that they could get out of God what Moses could get. But God made a distinction, and he does that. He made a distinction to let them know. He says, my servant Moses, he says, I will meet with and talk to face to face. Some of, some of you, I, I, I'm, I'm going to meet with you, but I'm not going to talk to you face to face like I do with my servant Moses. And he was depicting a special relationship. And many of the time, you will find that these pastors and these, these uh, spiritual leaders that this is the type of relationship that the Lord has with them. He has a relationship with them that differs from what each individual may have, the individual members of the church may have. Yes, you are special to God. Yes, everyone the Lord loves, but he will not deal with everyone in the same way. And if God chooses an individual for a specific task, that's what he intends. And, you know, we can't, we can't do a thing against who God chooses for what he chooses them to do. We can't do a thing against it. It is God who, who chooses. And he does make distinctions. And he always uses a leader. So we need to give it up about trying to um, have these churches that don't have leaders. God chooses and uses a leader. That is the model of his church. That is the model of how he um, gets messages to his people. He uses a leader to do it. So um, that is the institute that he has. And so we need not try to change that. What we need to do is get with the program, get with the process, and pray for these individuals that God has chosen in this way. These men and women of God who are friends to God, they're, they're like Moses. You know, they, God will meet with them in a way that he may never meet with the lay person or, the, the, you know, the uh, other ministers that there are people who um, are ministers in the body of Christ and God uses them in a great way, but God still have, makes a distinction for that person that is in that role of leadership. And you find that count, account where Abe, Aaron and Miriam, um, uh, God had to let them know. You find that account in Numbers, the 12th chapter, the 6th through the 8th verse. But also another very special example you will find is when Moses um, is, is standing on the mount. And Joshua is down in the valley fighting the, a war and a battle. And the Bible tells us that as long as Moses, Moses, the leader's hands were held up, the children of Israel, they were winning the battle. But when his arms went down, they were losing the battle. And now God could have won that battle in any way that he chose. He could have used Joshua. Joshua was a warrior. Joshua believed God. He could have used him simply to win that war. But he gave us an example and an illustration so that we can see that in even in the instance of this warfare that's going on, I want to let you know that Joshua is gifted and he is um, wonderful in the sight of God. God uses him mightily, 
But when it really comes down to it, God is coming to this man of God, who is this leader. That's who he is going to go to for the responsibility of the people. Now that the, the, um, the lay member or the ministers, they may not necessarily feel the responsibility of sticking to, um, sticking with a group of people to get them from knowledge, to understand it, to bring them up to a place of growth. They may not feel it necessary to do that, but God expects that from his leader that he has chosen. And so he gave us that illustration that as long as Aaron and her held up Moses, the man of God, the pastor of God, the spiritual leader of God, as long as they held his hands up, the battle was being won. And so that lets us know that God chooses whom he will. And he has a special relationship with who he wants to have a special relationship with. He chooses you to um, use you in a way that he desires, you know? And so uh, the next thing is pastors are ambassadors. Who are pastors to God? Pastors are ambassadors for God. In 2 Corinthians the fifth chapter and the 20th verse, the apostle Paul lets the church at Corinth know that he and the other spiritual leaders were ambassadors standing in God's stead to bring the message of reconciliation. He, they were standing in his stead. And so God uses these men, these pastors, these men and women of God who stand in his stead. When they are standing in the pulpit, they are standing in God's stead in order to deliver a message. Won't you, wouldn't you want to pray for a person that is doing that so that you can get all that God has desired for your life? Don't you want to pray for that person that they would release everything that God is, is giving out at that time? You should pray for that person. And so um, the next thing that outlines who pastors are to God is pastors, they are accountable to God. Now, I know that they, in their being accountable to God, they are accountable to the sheep. But really, when it all comes down to it, and when it all boils down to it, pastors are accountable to God. The Bible tells us, rebuke not an elder. So I know that you, you may think that you're right if you are up trying to tell a uh, pastor, um, something about what they've done or what they said, but you, you're wrong. That is not what God would have you do. The thing that you should do is pray for that pastor. If you feel like they are not operating in, in the right way, you have a relationship with God, you pray for that man or that woman of God. Pray that their heart would be changed. If in fact they are doing something that is not pleasing, um, you know, to God or pleasing to the body of Christ, but rebuke not an elder. They are accountable to God. And it is, and God requires something out of them in their accountability that you never require. God requires them to, 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 uh, behave in a certain way before his people. You can find that in Ezekiel, the 34th chapter and the second through the 16th verse, the word of God comes to Ezekiel concerning the pastor's accountability. The, the prophet is instructed to prophesy against. Now, they, they, he's prophes, prophesying against and warning the pastors and the shepherds of Israel. He warns them that they are, because they are only concerned with themselves. He warns those pastors who are not concerned with the well-being of the people. He warns the pastors that have um, useful knowledge and they refuse to release it. And then he warns, uh, you know, the pastors that have not sought after the sheep, their scattered sheep. He warns against that. And I just read to you about the fact that um, the prophet is the one that warned them. Now, I want to let you know there that God will allow others to speak into the lives of the man or the woman of God in a prophetic way, but it's not malicious. It is not something that you, uh, a person would take upon themselves to be malicious 
um, against the man or the woman of God because you feel like you're in a place that you can say certain things. But God only used the, he only used the prophets um, because we do find another account where Nathan had gone to David and um, we do find a, yet another account where Samuel had gone to um, also to um, Saul. Um, these leaders that God has chosen. And I'm, I'm equating these leaders with the pastors of today, these leaders of old, these kings of old with the pastors of today. And God will use people in those roles. But if you are not in that role to speak certain things into the lives of a pastor, you are not to rebuke a, pa a elder. You are not to do that. Um, take it upon yourself to do it. Um, you ought to have a place um, in their lives where you can speak certain things to them before you open up your mouth. And definitely don't do that before other people. Amen. Amen. So who are pastors to God? We've just read four um, very important um, things. Pastors are chosen from the very heart of God. Pastors are the friends of God. Pastors are ambassadors to God. Pastors are accountable to God. And so the next question I want to answer is who are pastors? Now, I felt it was important to talk about who pastors were to God first before I got into the subject um, of who pastors are. Who are pastors? Pastors are men and women of God who are set apart and called by God to lead a flock or a group of people. Pastors are one of the fivefold ministry gifts spoken of in Ephesians, the fourth chapter and 11th verse. Now, pastors can um, have one of the other four ministry gifts as their main gift. In other words, pastors can be apostles, um, prophets, um, and so forth. So pastors are shepherds. They are overseers. They are visionaries. They are stewards. They are equipters. They are elders, they are laborers, planters, they are plowers, sowers, growers, reapers, they are harvesters, they are waterers. And I know that I made up that word, but they, you know, the word of God tells us that one uh, plants and another uh, waters, and, but it's God that gives the increase. So pastors are, they water, they, they provide water and which is necessary for growth. Not only the planting, but they come back after the planting has been done and they water what has been planted. Amen. So that that individual can grow into a vessel that can be used by God. They are foundation layers. They are foundation builders. They are teachers, preachers, establishers, disciple makers. They are feeders. They are liberators. They are perfectors. They are spiritual parents. They are gatherers. They are imparters. They are counselors. They are mentors. They are coaches. And there are so many other adjectives that a person could use um, or nouns uh, because sometimes they use these words as nouns, shepherd, um, that many, you could, you could, there are a lot of words that you could uh, use that would describe who pastors are. And maybe um, you have thought about some of those things, the ones that I did not name, but that's a lot to think about. Um, when we're thinking about pastors. That was over 20 some odd things that I listed there. And they're expected to be those things. And sometimes they are all of those things in the lives of the people that they lead. They are wearing all of these hats all at once. And wouldn't you want to pray for that person who, who has the ability to be all of those things in your life? Somebody that is a visionary that could give you direction, um, give you a direction to, uh, or, or a path to travel in, um, that, that can plant some things and that can liberate you from things that, that would be your spiritual parents, um, that would counsel you. Um, that would coach you on to better living, day-to-day -day living. That's who they are. So when we think about um, importance of praying for pastors, we have to think about 
who pastors are to God and then who pastors are. These are this is who they are. They they are gatherers. They are, they impart. God uses them as stewards. They are equipped as they equipped uh, men and women of God with gifts that would be beneficial to the body of Christ. And wouldn't you want to pray for this type of person? Isn't that person worthy of you taking the time to pray for and intercede for? Wouldn't you want to pray for that person that, that, that God uses in this way in your life? He's the one that, God is the one that gives them the food to feed you. Wouldn't you want to pray for that person so that God would uh, release some things into your life, deliver you? That person needs to be prayed for. That pastor, that man or woman of God, that spiritual leader. And so the so we, we talked about who, you know, the importance of praying for pastors, why it's important. You know, we gotta think about the fact of who pastors are to God, who who are pastors. And then another very important thing that we need to think about is what do pastors do for their congregation? And the body of Christ. What do they do? Because they, in, uh, you know, I've I've laid out those nouns and those adjectives about who they are, but now I want to talk about what they do. So, number one, pastors they train, equip, and prepare believers to be functional in everyday life. So when you think about it, there are a lot of people that are so dysfunctional. But pastors are brought into a person's life to train and equip them and prepare them to be effective, to be functional in their everyday life. That's one of the, that's one of the things in your everyday life that you would be functional. That, that's, that's a great gift that, that God has given to the body of Christ. That you would be able to be functional. That that you'll be delivered enough. You'll be healed enough. You'll you'll receive enough counsel that will cause you to be functional in your everyday life. That's who pastors are. That's what they do for the body of Christ. Another thing is that they maintain a high level of connection and intimacy with God. They maintain a high level of connection and intimacy with God for you. They maintain that level. And I wanted to read a, a scripture in um, Acts. Let's turn right now to Acts, the sixth chapter and the third through the fourth verse. And I'm turning right now to Acts, the sixth chapter, the third through the fourth verse. So they, God, they, they are required basically to maintain a high level of connectivity and intimacy with God in order that they may be able to deliver a word to you. And we're going to find scripture on that in Acts, the sixth chapter, the third through the fourth verse. So let's read. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you, seven men of the Holy Ghost, Seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost, wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. So they basically wanted to choose out and use deacons, as they say, choose out these men that will be able to take over some of the, this work that's in this church so that we, as the men and women of God, are able to give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. So they, they, were, they wanted to be able to have that connectivity with the Lord so that they could deliver the word effectively. And that is what this scripture is talking about. They, that's what they do for the body of Christ. They, they maintain a high level of, of connectivity and intimacy with God for the benefit of the body of Christ. The second thing is that they watch for 
the souls of their congregation. They watch for the souls. And let's go to Hebrews now, the 13th chapter. I wanted to give scripture on this because many times uh, you, we say a lot of things and, and people may not necessarily um, uh, know exactly where to find it in the word. And we want to be scripturally based when we are talking about these things. Um, and, and as we are talking about the importance of praying for our pastors. And so we, we're talking now, what, what, what do pastors do for the body of Christ in their congregation? What do they do for them? And we just said that they watch for the souls of their congregation. And we find that in Hebrews, the 13th chapter and the 17th verse. So let's read it. Obey them that have rule over you and submit yourselves for they watch for your souls. And as that must give an account that they may do it with joy and not with grief for this is un unprofitable for you. So they watch for your soul. Those who are members of the congregation of a specific pastor, he or she is watching for your soul. They, they are watching to be able to speak words of deliverance in your, in, in your life. They are watching to see what areas the enemy might be fighting you. They are watching so that they can fight against the enemy on your behalf. They are watching for your soul. The next thing is they give account for the souls of the members of their congregation. And that's right in that same scripture. We just read it. It says that obey them that have rule. That's um, Hebrews 13 and 17. Obey them that have rule over you and submit yourselves for they watch for your souls. Uh-huh. And as they that must give an account that they may do it with joy and not with grief for this is unprofitable for you. So they have to give an account for the members of the, of that they lead, the people that they lead, you know, whereas people can get up and leave from one ministry to another, but the pastors do not have that luxury. He or she must watch for the souls. And not only that, they're going to have to give an account for the soul. You know, they, there's a, a scripture um, where the Lord says that he was angry. And we, we talked about it a little bit about it. Um, when we were talking about the fact that the pastors are accountable to God, we were talking about the fact that the Lord um, frowns upon those who um, don't seek after scattered sheep, you know, after the sheep has been scattered, those who don't go back and look for those who are wayward are lost and um, who are of their fold. And so, and the, you know, the scripture even gives us, us um, other account. <coughs> Excuse me. The scripture even gives us other accounts where we can um, see that the Lord himself, he basically says, you know, in, in the scripture that he would go after one. If one sheep, if there were one, if there was one sheep that was lost and 99 were there in safety, he would go after and look for that one. And so that's what he expects out of his men and women of God. And if you are going to think about, you know, something to pray for, Pray for that for your, your pastor. Pray, you know, because they have the concern of all of the people in their congregation. They they don't have the concern of every individual that they meet um, because they are not members of their congregation. But if they're a member of their congregation, they have the concern of all of them. All of them matter to that man or that woman of God. And that pastor at some point will have to give an account for those souls. So, uh, the next thing is that, you know, th this is continuing on the subject of what pastors do for their congregations. The next thing is that they lead and guide the members of their congregation. 
And we find that again in, in Jeremiah 30 through the 15th chapter where we're talking about knowledge, bringing them from knowledge and, and to a point of understanding um, where they are, are growing and um, loving on the Lord um, and having a relationship with him. I'm going to conclude this um, part one of this series of the importance of praying for your pastor. And I will continue and pick it back up with part two. Be blessed.